I don't want the world to revolve around me. If I were to fall off the earth or get sick, I want I want the people that work hard for me every day to have a job to come to. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of In the Den with the Digital Shark, Bill Russell. I am very, very excited to have a guest, quite frankly, that I've been trying to get on for a while, but we both have been battling some illnesses along the way, and uh, we finally got to get a little reschedule here. Um, and that is Richard Rogero of r and Electric HVAC out of Simi, California. Richard, how are you doing today? Great. How about yourself? I'm Bill? doing good. I'm doing good. I always like to start things off when we get somebody on the den and let everybody know that you are a client of yes, us. I and you have been a client for, for a, a couple of years now. Um, so I've gotten to know you over the course of time, and I've been able to spend some time with different people that, um, that we know together, Tommy Mello, Aaron Gaynor, uh, you know, Mario Compriano, you can go through the list of next star big wigs like yourself. And, you know, it's an, it's an opportunity to always share ideas. And that's one of the things that I love about the next star community. There's such a sharing of ideas, but I, I always like to just throw some random rapid fire questions at you. Okay. okay? Um, so that you have the opportunity to give people just an unfiltered view of who you are on a deserted Island. What would be the one record you would want? I think I know the answer to this and what would be the one movie you want? Well, I definitely want it's I'm going to throw a curveball to you because uh, I thought about, I was thinking the other day about this item in my head, what music, and I, I like a lot of different genres, but I'm really, uh, my wife and I are really good Prince fans. So the Sign of the Times was a book about around my teenage, that, that album came out around my teenage years and a lot of good, a lot of friends of I, friend of mine, I, we shared, we, we really loved that music with Prince. So I thought your answer was going to be Journey Escape. You know, that was. That was that was a, a hard second that I was going to go with. All right. Yeah. Well, at least at least I had some good idea of where. Oh you yeah, might be. yeah. What would be the movie? The Godfather. Uh, it's classic. Now classic. I, I will tell you. You know, it's interesting. You use that as your favorite movie that you would have. You could just watch. I think what makes a great movie is that no matter when you see that movie come on, as you're just randomly surfing the channels, you'll lock into it. Right. It can right. be halfway through. You lock into it. It has also the ability to say that sequels, okay, very rarely live up to the expectation of right. the first one. And that's one that did. Now, I'm curious, did you see Top Gun Maverick yet? I did. I was uh, one, of, I saw it uh, probably about four days before it came out to the. Okay. Yeah. Would you, what would you give that as a rating in comparison to the first one? Uh, you know, as I, I saw the first one I was, uh, came out, I believe in 84, 86, okay. I went in the Navy in 86. So that's the year it came so out. I was, I was 15 at the time. It was definitely, uh, a movie of the time. Uh, one of my all time favorites. So the second one definitely delivered, uh, lived up to the, to the first, I would, you know, I, I like, I like the fight sequences better, uh, because of the, the, the technology we have now. And the more hands-on that this uh, that they did with the with the jets, so definitely very entertaining and very. Uh, I think it hit all all emotions, and that's you know as an example to kind of what your your advertising should be. You know, one of those things that hits all emotions with customers. That's why they call. That's why they would you know do business with you. So, if you didn't get into the trades, what would you have done in your career? I would have wanted to be a high school basketball coach. Okay. Who would win Probably a game? In college. You, you or Ricky? Who would who would who would win a game one on one? Uh I, I gave I gave a 21 against Ricky and I. Uh today, today Ricky. But uh, you know, I think uh, some of my skill sets would the advantage I have is I I I I would lose gracefully, not not I wouldn't get blown out. So or he's going to let you win gracefully, being that you're his dad. I think I think he let his old man win first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know that one of the things you're big into is RV. Yeah. So are you into a fifth wheel or are you into a ride in the camper? 
Oh, the RV. Both of them have a have a uh, they have their pluses and minuses. But I'm an I'm an RV guy. I drive I drive an A class RV. You know, I hit once we park, I hit the button, everything pops out. You know, everything automatically levels. Everything automatically does pretty much everything. Uh, the disadvantage is you have to tow some button, something with it, something small if you want to get around. Right. Uh, with a trailer, a fifth wheel. Uh, but then, let me tell you, both come with uh, all the amenities and all the luxuries. And the only difference is you would just park the trailer. But once, like one of my friends just said, he goes, you know, we would never have this if Richard bought an RV and we were all partying in the RV. Because <laughs> he would never have this camaraderie, like, like this connection because we're we're all together in the RV having a good time, conversation, <laughs> Of course, I'm driving, but I'm still I'm still uh, participated in the fun. But um, yeah, it's uh, I love to entertain and I love to uh, entertain my clients, my guests, you know, my family, everybody. That's it's it seems like it allows you to decompress from how hard you work during the course of the week. Yeah, it's a, you know, as you get older in life, you get to reflect on uh, the pluses and minuses of the day of the week. You know what you did right, what you did wrong with employees, with business decisions with friends, family, I mean, just everything. And then also take some time for yourself. It's really hard sometimes just to sit there and enjoy the, you know, one would say meditation. The meditation we do, my wife and I will wake <laughs> on Monday morning, I woke up to the view of the, <laughs> of the ocean, uh, literally uh, about 20 feet away from my toes and uh, having a cup of coffee and uh, just taking it all in. So that was, that was sure. fun. Very, very cool. Um, if you could have dinner with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? Dinner with anybody dead or alive? Yep. Uh, I'd like to have dinner with my with my parents again. Yeah, I hear so. that one a lot when I do it. Um, the other one that's a common a common uh, answer is Frank Blau. Oh, yeah. as far as somebody to to speak with uh, in the business, uh, definitely. Um, would have been a guy named uh, Maurice Mayo, who I, I admire a lot. He was one of the founding members of Nexstar. Unbeknownst to me at the time when I joined Nexstar, I didn't know he was part of that when I bought his um, Seen His Believing seminar series and, uh, you know, his whole training method. That's why I got into flat rate and into the residential service industry was because of, because of him. Um, aside from the necessities that you need, food, water, What's one thing you cannot go a day without? Oh, toilet paper. Toilet paper. <laughs> love it. Love it. I love the answer. Um, I don't have to put leaves around me, so I have to. <laughs> well, let's get into the meat and bones of what we're hopefully going to talk in today. Is obviously, like I said, we have a lot of colleagues. Mutual. We become colleagues. We become friends. Um, the one thing that I love about you is your open and honesty um, as a business owner um, to tell the good and to tell the bad. I think that's in any relationship in life, you have to be okay to hear, hey, you're doing a great job, but you also have to be okay to hear, I'm not happy with the job that you're doing because right. that will always make you come back to doing the good job. Um, give us, let's let's go way back. How did you get into what you got going on as far as in the business, starting in the trades, probably... We're going to go a few years. We don't want to show our ages. But how did you get started in what you were doing? Well, uh, I was offered uh, Jim Herrick was playing for was coaching uh, basketball for uh, Pacific Palisades. So he had given me a four year scholarship. And then when he got hired on at USC, UCLA, he actually got, you know, some better choice players. I would say he had a much more uh, buying power. Uh, he offered me uh, still a scholarship for two years rather than four. Uh, back then, that's what they, they used to offer. So to get to the point, I remember sharing this with my sister one time and telling her, hey, what should I do? Should I go or should I stay uh, or should I do something else? And she says, you know, her, her point of view, she, she talked about the trades to me, oddly enough. You need to learn a trade. You need to learn something you're going to earn money. You know, what if they don't offer you? What if you don't get those two years? Uh, you know, our family's not in the position in the sense to uh, pay for the rest of those two years for you. And so maybe you should get into a field and that field was into the trade. And then, of course, my sisters, uh, my elder, I'm a, the youngest of nine children. I have four sisters and four brothers. And my, my eldest sister, uh, her husband was an uh, industrial engineer. Uh, he built uh, the Bonaventure and he built uh, the first interstate building. 
And so he got me into the electrical trade with uh, uh, um, one of my first bosses was a, a gentleman named Walter Bordeaux from North Carolina. And very, very intelligent man, very uh, hardworking man, very uh, smart man when he came to saving money and investing. He owned a lot of property. So that's how I got into the trades. When I was 17 and a half years old back in 1989, I hadn't turned 18 yet. So June of 1989. So you decide that you're going to go into the trades and had these young influencers, these influencers in your life at a young age. Tell me how it evolved to get to, to the point where you said, hey, I'm going to start my own company. You know, you're young. I was very, I'm the youngest of nine children. A lot of my brothers and sisters were getting married and uh, they had, they were either marrying guys that had, or marrying people that had businesses or started their own. Uh, so I kind of wanted to emulate and be like them. So there were example, my mother had a business of, a thriving restaurant business. Uh, and my father was in the trucking trade. So he had uh, his business and, you know, and they made, they made, we had a good life, but you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, we didn't live in Beverly Hills. That's for sure. So I looked up to them and that's why I wanted to emulate them. And so being young, you know, you want it all, especially if you're a, an ambitious person. And uh, I was able to move up the ladder really fast in my knowledge in electrical, I would work after work and on the weekends with a, a friend of mine who was a journeyman like, uh, electrician in a union and him and I would I would help him with projects that he uh, was doing personally uh, uh, for his friends and customers and whatnot. So there was a time that I saw even my boss and I saw and I thought being an electrician was really cool. I still think it's pretty cool of all the trades. Um, and um, and so that drove me to open my own business. I was licensed. I got licensed. I applied when I was 21 to be a contractor. And of course, uh, the math didn't add up to the state license board here. So I didn't really get my, my license until um, November 1st of, of 1994. So I had just turned 23 when I got my, I'm oh, sorry, 95. I had just turned 24 when I got my contractor's license. And then a month later, I opened shop and left a very, very well-paid job to um, to go into my own uh, my own venture, and you know, used a lot of my savings, a lot of my uh, hard work, and uh, grew the company. Were you with Kimberly at that point? I was. I had a uh, we had we had we had gotten married the year before, uh, bought our home. We had our first child in November of that year, 1995. Bought my home in May of 1995, and then opened business in uh, November of 1995. So there was a lot of things going on, and, and poor, and poor gal, you know, I, I had a very well-paying job just to go work for my own and discover that, um, you know, you don't. Uh, it's a whole different beast. I, I, I like to say that I was a good trades guy. I just wasn't. A, I wasn't. A, I wasn't a businessman. I didn't understand business at all. I did know how to count, so I know you have to have more coming in than going out. But uh, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot more to know uh, when you open a business. So you know that's a it's a common theory that you hear in in the business is that great tactician, tacticians have a hard time of getting out of their own way of running their business. There had to be something that kind of influenced you to say, in order for me to grow and scale, I have to get out of the truck. Was there a specific book? Was there a specific person that helped you to realize I got to do something different than what I'm doing or else? Because I always like to say it's like swimming when you have a business. You're right. going to do one of three things. You're either going to drown. You're going to tread water, which will eventually you'll drown. Or you're going to swim and you're going to learn how to swim. And everything I know, you've learned how to swim very, very effectively and grown and scaled the business. But what was it for you that helped you to do that? Oh, you meet a lot of great people on the way. I would say one of the, one of my, uh, as far as to answer that question, one of my mentors for many years and a very good friend of mine was a gentleman named Eric Dutton. He owned a plumbing company called Dutton Plumbing. Uh, he uh, sold his company about four years ago. <laughs> and, uh, the transaction finalized uh, in October of last year when he retired out. But um, him and Is I he met. still involved in the business at all? Uh, no, he, he, he was there for an additional two years after the sale. And uh, they decided to, you know. Uh, I get you. Most acquisitions, they're going to do that. 
Uh, and so he's, he's enjoying his time off front. I well deserved hardworking guy. Uh, he was the one that uh, the difference between him and I, as he's told me, Richard, the difference between you and I is that you can sell and do the job better than I can. That's why you tend to go out in the field to solve your problem versus I suck at sales and I suck at being a technician. So you, I don't have a choice, but to make it work from the chair here. And so he challenged me, he said, what if you build chair and you couldn't go out? So you start uh, training your mind that way. And so that uh, you could work. And I quote, he says, I want you to work on your business, not in your business. You know, great, great, great line. Yeah. I think, that's, I think that's the, you know, when you're in the, let's call it the million to a million and a half range, maybe mil five to two, there's a lot of tacticians that are, they're reading e-myths and saying, they're listening to what Gerber says and says, I got to get out of this. They just are stubborn to get out of it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Tommy Mello said something to me, um, and I know we're both good friends with him. He said, I'd rather pay some guy that's worth 400000 a year for four hours a month to give me the best education I can so that I can make my business run more effectively. Instead of trying to hire somebody that can do what I need them to do, but they don't have the knowledge that the guy that the $400,000 a year is, he can get me what I need. And then I can I, implement an extra. I truly, I truly agree one wholeheartedly in, what he, in that statement. And it's hard, you know, when you're a young businessman and not everybody wants to admit when they're, there's a lot of guys that go around flashing and, hey, man, everybody's got a credit card, buddy, you know, and they flash a lot and they talk a lot. And they're branding themselves and they're saying all these things. And, but they're not really, a lot of those guys, I mean, when they finally came to Jesus, they finally saw that, hey, my numbers didn't compute. The point I'm trying to get at is you really have to um, have the right people in place, understand how to utilize those right people, give them the freedom, and, you know, be able to monitor and coach as well as giving them the freedom to, to make great things happen as well as they're going to make some, they're going to make some mistakes as well. So I try to tell, um, um, you know, my business partner, Kimberly, she is a, a very, you know, the hardest working person I've ever met. And sometimes it's hard to instill in her that, Hey, we need to, she'll give me a million excuses why she doesn't need somebody. You know what I mean? But, um, but sometimes it's hard, you know, to make that determination. I don't want the world to rub bob around me. If I were to fall off the earth or get sick, I want, I want the people that work hard for me every day to have a job to come to, you know, and it's up to them to, to keep it in place. But I will tell you, uh, what's the saying, you know, um, uh, the, di the difference between um, being a, um, uh, between wisdom and knowledge, right? You know, wisdom is uh, learning from your, your mistakes and knowledge is learning from somebody else's. So Tommy Mello gives a lot of great information. And I'm fascinated by that guy, how much he can retain and applies and, you know, how, how his batteries are, how his brain moves, man. One of these days he's going to have to donate his brain to science. You know, well, I'm actually going out, believe it or not. I'm going out to see him on Thursday and Friday just from his training facility, the 40,000 square feet that he spent – and quite frankly, I, I've noticed that you've put a lot of emphasis into r and rs training facilities. You know, it, here it's grown enormously. I'm seeing 20, 30 guys in a room all being trained and developed. Is that more of an emphasis of Richard, Kimberly, Nexstar, or r and r R&R, &R, everything, all together, all the above. I think, uh, you know, we want to build, obviously you have to train your people. We were having a discussion yesterday at dinner with friends and uh, how the service, uh, how bad service was at one of these restaurants we came to. And I said, well, you know, it comes to uh, the people you hire, but it, it also starts from the top down. So the people, on, the owners can't be complaining because they're the ones that hire those people. So either you train them right, and you can constantly train them because, you know, people, uh, what is the, what does my wife say? She's the CF. She's always reminding everybody of, of uh, what they need to do and in, in, in coaching and instilling a lot, especially in her office. Her office runs like a machine. Um, I would but, call her the chief family officer, not the chief <laughs> financial officer, which she, no, she, 
chief reminding officer. We, we just, that's, that's the word I was looking for. But yeah, she's definitely, um, you know, we work good together. And, it, and it's, it's, I've had people call me about being married and, and working with your mate. And I said, well, I don't recommend it to everybody because it's not for everybody. And you got to be, you got to have your, your, you know, part of my friends, you got to have your shit together. So just imagine, you know, running a business, which has its obstacles and then running your, 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 your relationship and trying to separate church from state when you come to work. So it's not for everybody, but the ones that can do it, man, God bless them. Brad, you know? Brad Casebeer wrote a great book um, of his journey with him and Sarah, as far yeah. as how they've grown radiant and the, right. the infrastructure that, you know, she took the mad wizard known as Brad and let him be the mad wizard, but put the systems and the operations in place that would allow them to be one of the largest, you know, companies in the country. So um, that's that's really me. I'm the mad scientist. Say we're going to do this. We're going to go here. This is a but uh, the training center has always been something I've wanted to build. And matter of fact, we're in negotiations with. So we got about eight thousand square feet where we're at, but it's an effective eight thousand square feet. The building next door is uh, ten thousand square feet. That's adjacent. It's, it's they share a common wall. So we're in the process of negotiating, purchasing both buildings. And uh, either using the 10,000 square foot facility uh, for staff and on the and on the seven on the 8,000 square foot facility to have just for 1000 percent technical training because we want to get accredited and open up uh, a training school so that we can train kids here in California. That's awesome. You know, obviously. You're extremely well respected in Nexstar, and I see people come up to you want to understand what you're doing no that that is very much a, a thought process and you joined it in what 2016 if i'm correct how did that decision change your business oh dramatically because hey you, it's it's accountability to remember you know as business owners as much as i should talk about how accountable we are we really don't answer to anybody but our, ourselves so um and so I like the accountability that they have with our coaches. I do like the structure that they have. Give there. a shout out to your coaches. Oh, Scott Brinkley is our coach. Okay. I don't even tell everybody who my coach is because I don't want anybody taking. We don't need any more people. Uh, Billy Scott's Scott's. Uh, uh, there's just there's so many phenomenal people there in that order. Scott's Scott's one of the. You know we love Scott. You know he's he tells it like it is. Uh, does he has an answer? What I love about Next Star is that you don't get. You know, you get what you pay for. And let me tell you, uh, I've, I've been trying out a lot of different trainers just so that I could gauge, you know, and do my research and development and see which works. Mm -hmm. And each one of them serves a certain purpose to a degree. But overall, for the money that I spend, which is actually $2,000 less than I spent for uh, one of my trainers, um, you get so much back in all the aspects of it, because it's not just a business coach. There's marketing coaches. And it's like the hair and the, they might not be as flashy as you see these other guys on, uh, but they are, honestly, it's like the, the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise won the race and they will teach you, you know, because business things have not changed, you know, with the exception of, you know, marketing, which all marketing has gone from is from print to digital. And you have a different age groups that buy and different things that people look at. At the end of the day, you got to put your name out and you got to find the right platform with all the sequences to make it work. But and then have the right people to answer the phones to close those opportunities and then have the right people to get them to where they got to go to and then have the right people to go do the job and sell it and install it and collect so that you're you're accurate in your bid so that you could, you know, uh, provide the great service as well as be profitable. When you join Nextstar. What kind of revenue were you doing? Oh, I was under, I was at a million and a half with, with Nexstar okay. at that time because we had went through a transition and not to get into the details, but there was a, uh, there was a point in my business that, uh, you know, we, uh, we hit a rock and uh, on a personal, on a personal thing. So it stopped a lot of, uh, it stopped, the, stopped the momentum. So as you regroup and, and, and work past those things in life, you know, uh, you're looking for, and trust me, 
I went to next star. You're always looking at numbers. You're always looking at things and they, they throw out, you know, it was a $20,000 number they threw out. And, uh, we were, uh, you know, I was fully, once again, I became the throttle again. I wasn't the brakes and I'm like, Oh no, we're doing this. It's not a matter of if we're doing it. So we're signing up and we're, um, and guess what? I've never, uh, I truly believe, and it doesn't matter what level I get at, and no matter what training I go to, there's always something different. They, it's the same, but they add a little caveat to it. They add a little bit, whatever they, whatever evolution has come, they, they, they're teaching us something more. So if anything, I've learned to appreciate Next Star more so um, than ever. So what's the business on pace to do this year? Well, if everything goes right for us, I mean, we're, uh, you know, once again, we're, our numbers are different, but we're pacing to be at 14, two. So that's our pace, you know, uh, There's been good growth since, since we started working together, but that's incredible. You should be. Yeah. Fine. I mean, the bottom line too, is the number, what we keep is a pretty decent number. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what everybody needs to focus on. It isn't what you make, what you honestly can keep, you know. No doubt. EBIT does everything because that guy that wants to come and offer you that big, that big paycheck to walk away and go glamping for the rest of your life. He ain't worried about what that top line number is. He's worried about what that profit number is. Yeah. And he's buying it. And that, and those companies are buying systems. They're not buying me anymore because, or Kimberly, because they know that we'll be mulling going down the road. So you have to have a really good, uh, you got to have your team in place or you have to have a team in place to transition when you're no longer here. You know, it's, it's interesting that like when I think of, you know, people going to these shows and conferences um, as far as next our super meetings, getting ready to come up here in about 75 days, or maybe hundred days. And, you know, we're really excited. We're going to be doing a pretty cool little keynote. Can't give all the details yet, but another next star partner, it's going to be a dual thing and it is a hot product. And when you combine what these guys are doing with what we're doing, it's going to really blow some people's minds away. So I'm kind of giving the group a little bit of a tease, but that's the thing that I always say to people is, you know, the biggest challenge that I see people going to shows and they're taking notes and they're writing stuff down and they're totally immersed in what's being said, but then they come back to their shop and they don't implement greater than 5% of what they have the capabilities of. That to me, if you could just change it to say, I'm gonna implement 10% of what I learned at super meeting, you're gonna impact your business's growth astronomically. You know, as far oh, as- there's, there's one of one of our, uh, one of the larger uh, companies there as far as uh, is Mary Jean Anderson, which I think she's she was she was the the facility we toured when we joined Next Star because it was in San Diego at that time. And I've always been in awe of her. What a what a hardworking, intelligent woman and team that she has uh, of women that work there. I mean, it's a you know when it comes to service man, she, and for the ladies, she's kicking ass, man. She's just she's more than kicked ass. She's she's awesome, and uh, she's a very humble lady too, to a degree. You know as humble as you can be. And she's not afraid to share and help the, you know, help a fellow contractor or business owner and very modest. I mean, she didn't even brag about what she sold it for. You know, she took on, you know, an equity partner and, and, uh, and sold her business. And she sat up there and she's, she didn't brag about it. She didn't, but she did, uh, she did make a comment that, you know, she notices that the people that are more successful are the ones that are engaged and you can see the records there because you have uh, they monitor your level of engagement. Yes. So if you're not engaged in a lot of their practices, um, they um, and not to not so that they can you know give you a hard time about it, but so that if you when you come and you say this doesn't work, they're going to show you stats, right? Isn't that what's about? Your employees come and say, hey, I can't sell because well, then you show them stats, you show them figures, you show them opportunities are given and you know things. So. That's the one thing I appreciate uh, you know, being around those types of people because they're inspiring. And uh, and the next thing too that I wanted to share with everybody is uh, that my that my coaches explained to me when I was a kid. Anybody can anybody can get an A on the test or an A in the class. It's maintaining that A all through the years of your education. And it's the same in business, man. Anybody can hit a milestone mark in sales 
right? And that's fine and dandy, but can you do that and be profitable every year? You know, that'll be your minimum. You got to have to sell more and more, but still be profitable. So, you know, my number might be small to some and large to others, but we're profitable, you know. It's also a big growth from where we started. And oh, yeah. I'm just so happy to hear that. You know, let me, I want to caveat that for one second, because you, you're now in the realm where there's a lot of, you know, with the average next star member probably being somewhere in the seven, 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 eight range, you now become influential where people say, I want to go and see Richard's shop. Um, you know, it's interesting because I went to the next star retreat in Tahoe mm -hmm. and I got the opportunity to spend some time, time. It was like going to a destination wedding versus super meeting, which is like right. a mass, is like a mass, uh, a mass wedding of 400 people in a Catholic church. There it was like 90 people and you got to spend some really quality time with a lot of people. And so I got to meet Wyatt Hepworth and oh. he was so gracious to be able to just give me his time and energy. He invited us to come out and myself and CJ, we got on a plane. We went out because we wanted to see what's this guy doing that we can take that information. And besides the marketing aspect, which we feel like we do pretty darn good job. But what is he doing that I can make recommendations to, to our teams, as far as the way that they, you know, we're in a gas crisis. You, you, I, I got to believe you're at seven bucks a gallon in your neck of the woods. Yes. Um, but like, instead of having 400 trucks come back to the shop, they run this whole tooth fairy service. And like, they do. think about the impact that that puts into the EBITDA dollars, instead of having all that gas from somebody driving from Northern Utah back down to Orem, like crazy. And he opened up, he was, when I say gracious, he showed us everything. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't, he, he wasn't, he was humble. We went to five different sales meetings. We went to their HVAC tech meeting, we went to their sewer sales meeting. We went to their HV install. We went to their comfort consultant meeting. And it was crazy to me that they had five key KPIs that they measured across the board, like revenue brought in, close rate, number of reviews asked, number of re reviews received. And then you had a score that was evaluated based upon that. And based on where you finished, and your score was like gold, silver, platinum, black card. You got darts to throw at a dartboard. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So they were like, I think they were called any hour bucks or whatever it might be. However, long story short, if somebody in one of the meetings, no matter what department it was, had two zeros, zero reviews, zero brought in or zero close rate and zero reviews, Everybody had to get down and do five push-ups, And so we were in the sewer sales meeting and I turn and look and there's Wyatt down on the floor doing push-ups, doing push-ups like that kind of message as the CEO of that company, that is a strong family environment. I'm not afraid to ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Right. And so that caveat's a question. You have a family business. How, how do you go about in the family environment developing the leadership? My son, Ricky, runs a heating and air division, and he is... Uh, correct, me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Recently married? Recently married, yeah. He just got married to his, uh, his partner of seven years, uh, Carly. Uh -huh. A wonderful gal, beautiful gal, uh, inside and out. And... Uh, so he runs a heat and air division and he is also uh, in line, you know, we're, we're training him as the general manager. So he'll be that'll, before the end of the year, that'll be one of his full his, the hat. He'll transition on. My middle son's out in the field. He is a service tech, HVAC service tech, but he has, he's very knowledgeable and electrical because, you know, when he was younger, dad taught him that. And then uh, my youngest son, he is the inventory control and it's almost He's about 95% done with full automation in our, so 
Our system will be the two thirty system as well. And then my wife, you know, and I share the business responsibility. She's she's pretty much the head of operations here at the office. And I don't know what I do anymore. I think I walk around and just say hi and kiss babies. So that's what I try sometimes, to do. Sometimes it's good for somebody to be the mayor and somebody to be the sheriff. You know, I go out in the field and but. You know, we have our electrical manager, Jose, he's been with the company 25 years, you know, he's, uh, he's our electricals and what a great, what a great, uh, um, supervisor that he is and really cares about the guys and really, and he's one of those guys down in the trenches. So there's not an answer, a question he can't answer for you and help you through. So having the family here, we all, my sons, especially, they know that, um, you know, when it's business and when it's family time. And, uh, so uh, we're, we're passionate, but we're also professional and, uh, you know, we, um, and we try our, uh, it's fun to, you know, they're here because they want to be here, not because I need them, you know, right. that's, that's the most important thing, you know, um, you know, my son, Ricky has a business degree in uh, business and in economics. Uh, my, my son, Robert was in the air force for a couple of years playing mm-hmm. football, decided to come back home. Uh, you know, he wanted to, uh, you know, be closer to home. So that's what he did. And then my younger son went to college, played football, came back and wanted to be a tech. It's fun to be around your family and, and to do that and to see them uh, and have the guidance that I wish I would have had, uh, you know, from day one, uh, let's say in my, in my father's business, but I didn't work with my father in his business. So, I got two final questions before I give you the final roar. Number one is I've heard you say, um, that you are committed to excellence. Yes. But you're not always going to be excellent. Can no. you elaborate on that? Well, uh, you know, you, you go into a project. Uh, I'll give an example. You know, we, uh, we did a project. customer wasn't happy with how the project was operating, uh, this electrical circuit. I went out there with uh, one of our managers wasn't available. And right out the gate, I didn't like the way it looked, let alone it's operational. And to, to look at your customer square in the face and say, hey, we've made a mistake. This isn't to our standard. Would you be so kind if we could replace this and have it done correctly to our standards? And I mean, I was able to get it operational for them and that wasn't the problem. It wasn't unsafe. It's just a couple of wires were not phased correctly, but I didn't like the way it looked. So not only did we repair that, but, you know, we even painted the wall that it was mounted on just as a thank you, you know, for an understanding. And uh, so those are the things that we do to, to, to commitment to excellence, training your staff, which Tommy Mello talks a lot about. And a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of guys out there that are uh, running great organizations talk about training their staff. They've learned it from somewhere and they're applying it. But at the end of the day, you can read every book. You know, you can have, I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a book on the shelf for seven years and I decided to read that one book. When I read that book, I wanted to kick myself in the head because I would have solved the seven years of problems that I was having. What was the book? It's a book from the 1920s, right? Yeah, it's right wow. here. Um, uh, it's well, about- I'm sure I, I, that is an excellent segue. Because when I have people reach out to you and we'll go through that contact, they're going to want to know what that book is. Um, yes. here's, here's my last question. You know, everybody is talking about where our country's headed. Oh, we're headed to a recession. You know, we talked two years ago that we were headed into COVID. And I've seen record profits and record sales numbers for the word essential business wasn't determined two years ago, but now it is. Do you see your business slowing down? Because this is where I make the recommendation to clients. This is where you forge ahead. You can't pull back. You have to push forward because there are going to be people that are going to pull back. Tell your audience how you, you know, our audience about how you're going to look at the next six months so that you can hit those numbers. So what I learned, uh, publications, there's a mechanical magazine or HVC magazine that I, I read every so often. In this particular magazine, I was reading about recession periods. This was before COVID because over the last three years, Nextstar at some of our super meetings, and sometimes, you know, you get 
so busy. You say to yourself, I'm not going to go to these meetings. I'm not going to attend this thing, this class, this practice, whatever it is. I'm glad I attended it because a lot of it had to do with prepping us about a recession coming. They didn't know. Nobody knew about COVID or anything. Right. So uh, by reading, you know, by preparing, you have to prepare. So the, the one thing is that what the one thing you can count on is that there are typically four seasons in a year, right? You have spring, summer, fall, and winter. And each one of them brings their share of preparation, right? And fun and, and whatnot. So uh, in business, you have to always treat it that way. And just because we're essential today might not be we're going to be essential tomorrow. But, you know, we're not going to close down. We, we have to learn from what has happened and how, you know, uh, and that's where you sit down with your staff or you sit down with your leaders in your company and you say, hey, guys, what did we learn this last year? What did we learn during COVID? You know, what were the pluses and the minuses? And so the one thing you want to be prepared for is, Make sure you have multiple financing platforms for your product. Okay? You don't go, most people don't go buy a car uh, cash, you know, not everybody, right? And some would say, why would you do that in the first place from an accounting standpoint, depending on where you're at? But you wouldn't go do that. So people are going to be having to make these large purchases because what was once a $10,000, $15,000 installation is easily $25,000 now. How are they going to buy that? And are they going to, which banks are going to be available for them for the ones that need that help? So preparing with your financing, training your people constantly on how to benefit and, you know, um, how to maximize on repairs with their customers so they can help them save money on their equipment if they choose not to replace it. Uh, and don't, and don't, repairs are, believe me, guys, if you know how to train your people right and you're really looking out for the customer and you're doing, uh, there's a quite a bit of profit to be made from repairs. I'm not talking about a hundred dollar repair. I'm talking about fully repairing the system and bringing it up to speed. You know, keeping your people motivated and away from the television set, because news, bad news, travels in all different forms and it puts people in negative states. So you know what? At the end of the day, you know, like I said, my mentor Eric Dutton, he told me straight out when I called him about two weeks into COVID, and I was a little nervous, right? We, we had work, but things were kind of, you know, I remember kind of hoping he would share a gloom with me. And he says, oh, he goes, are you kidding? Listen, we smell and inhale and work under worse conditions than this COVID stuff. You know, why are you so afraid? You know, what be afraid? Don't teach your people to be afraid. You know, right now is, you know, help them uh, empower them, you know, lift them up because they're all stressed out. So that's what we try to do to prepare for what's coming. Uh, and when it comes, there's always an advantage that you will have, right? Right. So I'll give you an advice. When one of the recessions hit, my friend Eric Dutton, he was able to double his ad space, his real estate on the yellow pages at back then, and his radio ads at the same price or less in certain situations because he was an anchor ad, right? So I give that recommendations to a lot of people when that time comes. They're all going to your advertisers are going to want to try to help you to stay in business because they're in business too, just like we do with our customers. Um, so don't pull back your advertising at all. That's and on the contrary. If you do, you benefit me when you do that. No so doubt. Don't pull away your advertising. Um, I made the mistake of knowing that when I did that, it was going to be the kiss of death and it was the kiss of death. So first of all, I want to thank you very much for your time. I know how busy you are. Um, we've been trying to schedule this for a while and uh, you know, it's, it's always great just to be able to spend some time not talking about your business as far as numbers, but talking about business. And I really truly appreciate that's a, that's something that you always bring to me um, when, whether we see each other in next star event or where we just having a phone conversation. And I, it, it, I, I believe our relationship has gone beyond business. I believe it's a friendship. Um, but there's business involved and that, that part is always important. Um, how can people reach you if they want to, they want to pick your brain? What's the easiest? You can always call me in my cell. I'm available. My cell number is. I'm trying to get my cord. I apologize. I don't want my iPad to die on me. Uh, my cell number is 818-612-9556. And my uh, email is richard at rrelectrichvac.com. All right. I appreciate that. So we have something we call the final roar here. Um, if you could go back 
to talk to Richard and Kimberly when you started the business after buying the house, after having the kid, what's the advice you're going to give Richard? The advice would be to seek knowledge out there for what you're getting into and implement it. Don't be afraid to implement it because that's the educated win. You know, because you're if you're afraid, well, you keep guessing and you're not getting it right. So don't guess, get it right and find the information out. And it's out there. There's there's a great book by the guy about by a guy by the name of Howard Partridge called Failure to Implement FTI. Um, and it gives 10 principles that if you adhere to those 10 principles, you're going to help your business grow. So, well, listen, my friend, stay on the line. I appreciate everything that you have given our audience as far as recommendations, thoughts, background on you um, and where your business is come and go. And I, I, I celebrate your success. I know how hard you work and uh, how hard the rest of the family works. Thank you very much. Can I give a plug for you to everybody here just so that you know, guys, it's not all fluff here. I am a direct person and I will tell you how I feel when I feel it. And Bill is one of the guys that I've probably been direct with the most, especially when we were signing on. I'm a no nonsense guy. I heard every pitch in the planet uh, when it comes to what they're going to promise to me. And when I put Bill to the test and, and, and I grilled him, he was able to answer those questions like a professional. And not only did he answer them, they came through for us. It doesn't mean that we don't. The good thing about it is that we meet every so often and we go over uh, to the point that if I don't have that meeting, I miss it. And I get I, I wonder what happened if I fell off the planet with you guys. But uh, it's truly been a great uh, business investment. And then to be able to be friends about that is even better. So. Well, listen, Bye. my friend, I, I appreciate those kind words and I look forward to are, you're going to super meeting, right? I will be at super meeting. Make sure you book your reservations. JW is going fast. I know I got to do that today. Uh, but anyways, thanks again, Bill. And uh, say hello to your wife and your beautiful family and, uh, and to the rest of the gang at 1SEO. Thank you.